It's, it's good to be with you this morning. I see some uh, I see some faces I haven't seen in a few weeks, and I see some folks who've been on vacation for a while. We're glad to have you back, and I guess school is either started or getting ready to start. And uh, can you believe that? Can you believe summer's almost over? It's really it's really hard. I don't know about you, it brings a tear to my eye, but. Uh, we're glad to be back together, glad to get started into the fall, and we've got some exciting things that are, that are taking place here at Oakdale, and, and we're glad that you're here to be a part of them. We're in the fifth week of our summer series called Move Me, and the reason that we're calling it that is that we've learned from the book of Acts that the church was never about a building. The church was never a place. It was never about an organization. From the very, very beginning, the church was a movement. It was a movement that was made up of people who joined their lives together for the purpose of taking the message of Jesus out into the world. In week one, we looked at the opening day of church when Peter preached the very first church sermon and more than 3,000 people placed their faith in Christ as Savior that day. In week two, we looked at Acts chapter four where the believers showed great boldness in the midst of their first hint of persecution. And in response to that, we as a church, we also committed to spend some time daily in prayer over the next few weeks, praying this prayer. God, please enable me to speak your name with great boldness and bless me in such an incredible way that it would capture the attention of lost people around me for you. And, and it's been exciting to hear some of the stories uh, over these last weeks as people have talked about trying to uh, think in terms of blessing and think in terms of boldness when they're talking to other people and uh, just in the middle of their day or whatever may be going on around them. In week, in week three, we looked at Acts chapter 5. Uh, if you remember, the apostles were rounded up and they were flogged. We talked about what that meant. They were tortured because they kept boldly preaching and healing in Jesus' name. And they just wouldn't stop it. And at the end of the day, we gave each person a little rubber bracelet or a little rubber ring just to use as a, a daily reminder to take every opportunity God gave us to be bold for Him in the remaining four weeks that we had. Do you still have your, uh, you still have your bracelets? You still have your rings? I've had to replace a few of them. People have come and say, hey, you know, I, I lost mine. I don't know what happened. I'm a rough sleeper, I guess. Uh, not sure where it is. Can you help me out? But it's been neat to watch people uh, b just with a commitment to be bold in the way that they live every day. Last week we looked at Acts chapter 9 where we learned the story the incredible story of, of Paul, who, who really was an amazing example of boldness for each of us to follow. We learned that if we're going to be bold like Paul, then we've got to understand that a bold message, it doesn't have to be a complicated message. And that our personal experience with Christ is the most important tool we have in sharing the gospel. Now, today we're going to do something, we're going to study something that I know for a fact you guys are going to be so excited about. In fact, I've been excited this whole time because I knew this was the day, I knew this was the Sunday, and, and for some of you, this is your greatest passion in life, all right? Uh, we're going to talk today about your favorite part of, of being a Christian, the very first church business meeting. Amen? Right? The, I'm serious. You, you, you say, what? Are you kidding me? They really had business meetings in the early church? You better believe they did. Not only did they have business meetings in the early church, but had it not been for the specific topic, at the very first business meeting, only three or four of us would even be here in this place worshiping this morning. Now, are, are you interested at all? Are you curious at all? As to what the topic was, let me give you a little bit of background. Between Acts chapter 9, where we left off last week, and chapter 15, where we pick up today. In fact, if you have your Bible, uh, you want to follow us, that's where we're going to be, Acts chapter 15. Between those chapters, the original apostles had, for the most part, stayed in Jerusalem. They were building up the original ecclesia. Remember that word from the first week? Uh, the original gathering of believers. Meanwhile, Paul was out in the world teaching the gospel planting little ecclesias, little churches in, in small towns and big cities all over the known world. Now most of the people that Paul was reaching were Gentiles, which just basically means anybody who is not of Jewish descent. Okay, uh, That's about 98% of us who are here. And, and there are a few people here 
who probably can, can trace their heritage back and go, yep, you know, I, I'm of Jewish descent in some way. But for most of us, that's not the case. Most of us, we are what would have been considered Gentiles. So here's the problem. While it was great that people were coming to Christ by the thousands and that new churches were being birthed in nearly every city, to this point, no one had really sat down and thought through a policy on an issue that to this very day is still one of the biggest sources of conflict and one of the biggest sources of disillusionment when it comes to the modern church. Now, what is that issue? It's this. Who gets in... And how? Who gets in and how? In other words, who qualifies for membership in the church? And how do they qualify? What rules do you have to follow? Now, how good do you have to be to be considered a Christian? How good do you have to be to cons be considered a church member? This is what the early church was dealing with. And believe it or not, this is the same issue that churches are still dealing with today. Now, in terms of the early church, if you understand just a little bit about Jewish history, I, I think you'll see why this was a problem and why it was an issue. If you go all the way back in the Old Testament, uh, around the book of Exodus, and you have God's chosen people, which we refer to as what? We, we call them the... No one knows anything about the Old Testament. God's chosen people are the Israelites. Exactly. Uh, Israel was led out of Egyptian slavery and into the wilderness by God's chosen man, whose name was, yes, Charlton Heston. That's right, Moses. Okay. God, uh, Moses, God's chosen man, was called up to Mount Sinai to receive a list of rules that explained how his chosen people should live. And we call that list of rules the Ten Commandments. Good. You, you guys are doing good. Now, the Ten Commandments basically work like this. God says, you follow these ten rules and you will be my people. You'll be in with me, God. Well, between the moment when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 and the point at which membership in the church, the New Testament church, became an issue in Acts chapter 15, you've got centuries and centuries and centuries of Israelites, later called Jews, trying to figure out this whole, I've got to follow the rules to be in with God thing. And what they do over all those years is, one by one, they add rules to the original Ten Commandments. Now, it's not like they were saying, we think we're smarter than God, you know, that we know better what the rules should be. It's not that. It's just that every time a situation came up, and you'll see this happen in churches today, every time a situation came up and they weren't sure how to deal with it, or they thought maybe they didn't deal with it very well, what they would do is they would add another rule to try to keep it from ever happening in the future. Does that sound familiar? I mean, we, we churches do that all the time. Well, the problem is, by the time of Jesus, by the time of the New Testament church, it was no longer the Ten Commandments you had to follow to be in with God. It was 613 commandments that you had to follow to be in with God. Now, would you agree with me that the typical human being isn't all that good at following the Ten Commandments, right? So how do you think they did trying to follow 613? Not very well. But this was the system they devised, and this was the system they were used to. So when Jewish men and women who were already attempting to follow the 613 rules that had been in place for a couple of thousand years, when they became followers of Christ, th think about this, they thought in terms of we have added a commitment to Jesus, a faith in Jesus as Savior, onto the system that we already have in place. Does that make sense? We, we take our commitment to Christ and we put it onto what we've already been doing. So they do not think of themselves as Jewish Christians. They thought of themselves as Christian Jews. Do you see that? Do you see why it might be that way? Well, what happened was after several years of the gospel spreading out into the world, it certainly suddenly occurred to these Christian Jews that the Gentiles were becoming followers of Christ and they weren't automatically becoming Jews first. In other words, they didn't think of themselves as Jews. They didn't necessarily follow the 613 Jewish rules. Didn't necessarily even know what they were. And there was at least one other minor surgical procedure that they weren't participating in. And we'll get to that in just a moment, okay? So it's almost like all of a sudden it hit them one day. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. These Gentiles aren't following the rules. They're not becoming Jews first and Christians last. 
And again, the problem was nobody had been telling the thousands and thousands and thousands of Gentiles in hundreds of towns and cities anything about this. In fact, Paul was out there telling Gentiles everywhere, you are saved by faith in Jesus through grace plus nothing else. So even though they hadn't been following the Jewish customs, as far as they knew, they were completely good with God. They were in with God in the sense that they had been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. So even though they hadn't been following those customs, they knew that they belonged to God. But the Christian Jews back in Jerusalem, they were not so sure about that. In fact, they went so far as to say, look, Gentiles, we'd be glad to have you. Now remember, about 98% of us are Gentiles. Guys, we'd be glad to have you, but first, you're going to have to get yourselves cleaned up. You're going to have to get yourselves presentable in terms of the law, and then we'll think about letting you in. Well, you can probably imagine how the Gentiles felt about that, right? I mean, that, that does not seem much like what they had been, been taught and what they had learned. So as I mentioned earlier, the early church did what all good churches do when there's a conflict or when there's a big decision that's got to be made. They called a business meeting, right? Yay, business meeting! I, I know you guys love this. I, I know you're excited. All right, so here's what happens in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Here we go. Certain individuals came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, these are the Gentiles, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. All right, so you've got some Christian Jews, you've got some teachers. They're going to the city of Antioch, uh, which is at the northern tip of, of Judea where Paul was planting churches. And these teachers, these leaders, they were telling the Gentile Christians that they need to become Christian Jews if they want to be in with God. Not only that, but they were telling the Gentiles, you have to be circumcised in order for it all to count. Now, how do I put this in a way that's sensitive and yet clearly communicated. How about this? The Christian Jews telling the Gentile Christians that they needed to be circumcised is sort of like a, a chicken and a pig that were walking down the road one day. All right? The pig says to the chicken, man, I feel like breakfast. The, the chicken replies, me too. Who's up for eggs and bacon? Right? I mean, for, for the chicken, that's a little bit of effort. But for the pig, that's a pretty big sacrifice, right? And that's kind of how it was for these Gentiles and what the Jews were asking them to do. Total sacrifice. Here's verse 2. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas, they were saying, no, 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 this isn't right. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. Now, if, if you're reading along, skip down to verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and are required to keep the law of Moses. Now, do you, under, do you understand what we're talking about here? Again, in verse 5, some of the Christian Jews who were leaders in the church were also part of the religious group called the Pharisees. Now, we typically boo and hiss when we hear the word Pharisee, right? I mean, we understand that that, that, that group of Jewish religious leaders are the ones who gave Jesus the most trouble, right? They eventually had him arrested, tried, and executed. But see, the Pharisees, they'd spent the first half of the New Testament as bad guys. But after Jesus' resurrection, some of those Pharisees, they became followers of Christ. I, I, I don't know if you know that. And if you think about it, that's pretty exciting. To think that the villains of the story, they take off their black hat, and they put on the white hat, and they join the good guys. I mean, that's great drama. Well, the only problem was, apparently, old habits die hard, don't they? Here's what they were basically saying. Paul, what we're going to need you to do is we're going to need you to get back on your boat. We're going to need you to go back out to all of those cities and towns where you've been planting churches and, and, and reaching people for Christ. And we want you to tell all those people who have thought for five or ten years now that they are Christians, that they're not really Christians, okay? We need you to do that. That if they want to become true believers, they're going to have to follow 613 rules that we've come up with over the years that we think makes you a real God follower. 
They're going to have to start eating differently. They're going to have to start dressing differently. They're going to have to start bathing differently and worshiping differently and doing things differently on the Sabbath. Oh, and by the way, Paul, don't forget to tell them about that minor surgery that they're going to need to do as well. And, and, and tell them that when they've got those 613 rules down pat and their lives are all cleaned up for Jesus, then they can be a part of our church. Now, when we hear that, uh, I think as predominantly Gentile American Christians, we think that is absolutely absurd, right? I mean, it's pretty easy for us to look at that and go, that's ridiculous. There is no way. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And I, I want to warn you not to judge them too harshly. Because here's the problem. Once you've been in a church for about 10 years, this kind of, of thinking, it tends to creep in for all of us. I, I mean, we think we're so open-minded. We think we're so, you know, non-judgmental. But every one of us from time to time will see someone or we'll meet someone, or we'll go someplace new, and the thought will hit you, boy, she sure doesn't look like a Christian, right? Hmm, he certainly doesn't dress like a Christian. D does that sound familiar at all from your brain? In fact, let, let's, you know, let's just see how transparent Excuse me, we are as a body. How many of you admit that you've thought something like that at some point before in your life? Come on, go ahead. All right, look around and realize that all of us do this, whether we realize it or not. If we're not very, very careful, we will naturally settle into, listen, our version of Christianity. That's what we do. And then somebody comes along and they don't fit our version of Christianity and, and we become, you know, how do I say this? We become almost pharisaical about it, don't we? We become pretty comfortable with judging people, not according to God's standards, but according to whose standards? Our standards, okay? Well, preacher may not be in the Bible, <clears throat> but I think we all know that God has a standard for how He wants people to dress when they come to church. Right? I mean, we know that. Well, really? And which standard is that? Is that the 20th century standard of dressing? Is that the 16th century standard of dressing? Hey, let's just be really biblical about it. How about the first century standard of dressing? Look, that would be great news for my 11-year-old because there is nothing he would rather do in the world than show up at church next Sunday in his bathrobe and flip-flops, okay? He would think this was the greatest church that ever existed if we held him to the first century standard of the way we dress. You see, it is so easy for us to create our own personal version of what Christianity looks like. And guys, that's exactly what was going on in Acts chapter 15. The church hadn't even got the wrapping paper off yet. And they were already judging people according to their own standards instead of God's. Let's go back. Verse 7 now. Verse 6. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up. All right, Apostle Peter. And he addressed them. He said this, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. So Peter had once been on sort of the Jewish side of this argument. Now he was on, because of something God had done, he was on the Gentile side. Verse 8, for God who knows the heart, and, and let's pause right there. By the way, do you believe that? Do you believe that God knows the heart? See, I don't know your heart, do I? I don't know your heart. I only know your behavior. True or false? You can always know somebody's heart by looking at their behavior. True or false? It's false. You can sometimes know someone's heart by their behavior. But you sometimes can't. Only God knows the heart of a human being. Verse 8, again. God who knows the heart showed that He accepted them, the Gentiles, by, listen, by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as He did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them. For He purified their hearts by what? Come on, the big important word. He purified their hearts by, by faith. He, he says, we've been telling them it's all about faith. And that's how their hearts were made right. Then in verse 10, He gets really personal. Verse 10, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of, of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? Now think about what Peter's saying. 
He, he's saying what everybody had thought from time to time, but no one really had the guts to actually say that this whole 613 commandment thing, it doesn't work. It never worked. It wasn't what God was trying to do. We've just been deceiving ourselves all this time that we're actually good enough to be in with God when the reality is none of us is even close. Right? None of us even gets close. Now, maybe on the outside we can fool some people, but if we ever come to the point of admitting that God does not really care that much about the outside, He looks at the inside, then the whole game is over. Because we know good and well that we were never, we never were, and we never will be good enough to be in with God. Verse 10 again, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we, our ancestors, have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And I'm telling you, that right there, that's the key to this whole thing. We've got to admit that we were never going to be good enough on our own. But thanks to God, we don't have to be. You see, God does not say to us, Hey, why don't you get your life in order and then come back to me? All right? Why don't you get yourself cleaned up? Why don't you get your habits in order? Why don't you get your lifestyle in order and then come back to me? Does He say that to us? No. The truth is, God can purify a heart before you purify your life. God can purify a heart before you drop that nasty habit, before you fix that marriage. In two sentences, Peter sums up the difference between the Old Testament law and New Testament faith. You're never going to be good enough, but you don't have to be. And God doesn't expect transformation from you until after He's transformed you. I hope that makes sense. Because that's the essence of what the New Testament is all about. Now, this is immediately followed by Paul and Barnabas giving some testimonies about how God has been at work among the Gentiles. Then, in verse 12, here's what happens. The whole assembly, it says, became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And this is the point in the business meeting where an awkward silence occurs. Have you ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, the, the Pharisee Christians have established, they kind of got strength in numbers over here, if not in theology. Peter stands up and, and he says something that nobody's really thought about before. They're not exactly sure if, if they agree. Paul and Barnabas, they, they get up and they kind of toss a Hail Mary pass. They start talking about, well, you're not going to believe everything God's done to these Gentiles. It's really incredible. And they're hoping maybe, maybe, maybe they'll see you know, their side of things. They'll see that God has been at work. But now we're at that place. It's that awkward, silent place where whoever speaks next, next is probably going to determine the course of the early Christian church. I mean, if you've, if you've ever been a big part of business meetings, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If someone speaks up next in support of Peter, someone with credibility who demonstrate that there's logic and reason and truth in what Peter said, the business meeting goes in, in a very different direction, right? You know how it's going to end. But if a Pharisee Christian speaks up, this is sort of where chaos you know, probably breaks out, people speaking over one another, and by the time it's done, the meeting has gone in a very, very different direction. The Pharisees are going to win. The Gentiles are going to be excluded. And 2,000 years later, it is very, very unlikely that any of us will be sitting here. So, what do you think happens? Verse 15, 13, verse 13. When they finished, James spoke up. Now, again, I, I want to emphasize, James is the brother of who? Jesus. James is actually Jesus' brother. And he came a little late to the whole, you know, apostle-disciple thing. But he is now a very important person. And he's one of the probably, you know, top two or three leaders in this new movement known as Christianity. So you understand, as Jesus' brother, whatever he says next is going to carry a lot of weight. Right? They're going to listen to what he says. Here's what he says, verse 13. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, that's Peter has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for His name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And, and then he actually quotes some Old Testament 
prophecy talking about Jesus, talking about how our world would be saved. Let's skip down to verse 19. James goes on, Therefore, it is my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I, I, I want you to think about what we just read, okay? And I want you to answer some questions for me. Is it okay with God if we break His commands? Not human commands, but God's commands. Is God okay with that? No. Is it okay with God if we do things like steal, kill, covet, worship other gods? Is God okay with that? No, absolutely not. Does God want us to love Him? Love others? Love our enemies? Absolutely. Okay, big question. Does God expect or require us to do any or all of those things before we become a Christian? Is it possible for us to do any of those things before we become a Christian? Sure, it happens all the time. People are able to, to kick a habit. They're able to let go of some lifestyle that, that they've become a part of. They're able to make a new commitment, put their old stuff behind them for a little bit. Does that happen sometimes? Absolutely. But I want to know from you, is it required? Yes or no? It is not required. The answer is no. And James says that's why we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles to come to God. He says we want to see Christ come into their life, the Holy Spirit come into their heart, and when that happens, trust me, there's going to be a transformation. We can't expect them to act like Christians, I'm not even sure that's a good idea, before they become Christians. Lost people act like lost people for a reason. Anybody know what it is? Because they're lost. I don't know what most of your excuses are, okay? But lost people, they act lost because they are lost. Now, James says that that's why we cannot make this difficult. We want to encourage them to trust Christ. We want to encourage them to become Christians. In verses 19 through 20, James recommends some sort of, it's a compromise, sort of some basic rules that, that he thinks would ease some of the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles, sort of a balance between law and grace. And then in verse 22 through 29, the church leaders, they actually, they draft a letter for Paul to deliver to Gentile believers around the world. And it sort of explains what's happened and, and the decision that they've made and, and it encourages them as they continue to grow in their relationship with God. And here's maybe the best part of this whole thing. All right, here's verse 30. Here's what it says. So they were sent off and they went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. Now listen to this. The people read it and they were glad for its encouraging message. See, that's what Christianity is supposed to look like. Because that could have been a whole different situation, right? Oh yeah, I've been there. I've, I've been a part of the other letter. Uh-huh. I've been a part of, of that deal where, you know, we're going to choose up sides and hate one another. And it's no good. And it doesn't honor God. Anybody ever been a part of a WWF-style business meeting? Where the deacons come off the top turnbuckle and they're given, you know, forearm shivers. And it's not, it's not, we, we giggle now. It's not funny then. It's, it makes you feel sick, doesn't it? If you've ever been a part of something like that. And I love verse 31. The people read it. They read that, the decision that, that they had come to. And they were glad for its encouraging message. And I think it's safe to say that five or ten years later, they could all look back on that day and say, that's the day we avoided what would have been the very first church split. And you know what? Who knows how different our world might be if they had written that letter differently. Now, I want to leave you with three things that we must avoid as a church it, based on what we see here in the early church. In the early church, okay? If you've got your notes there, I, you've held on to them till now, or you've doodled, you know, pretty pictures. I, I love coming in after the services and checking out your artwork, and uh, it's just, it's beautiful. I love that. But, but now we're going to write, okay? Now I want to show you some things that we really need to understand based on what we just read. As a church, we must avoid a drift towards insiders and away from outsiders. Write that in if you would, a drift.
I mentioned in week one, you say, that sounds familiar. That's because in week one, I, I talked about the fact that there's always going to be a tendency for us to become inside focused instead of outside focused. And that's why from the very beginning of this series, I've challenged you to be bold. You know why? Because when you're busy being bold for God, you don't have enough time to become insider focused. When we're bold for Christ, we get so excited about what God is doing that we don't have time to bicker and fight over little things that don't matter that much. Here's number two. We've got to be able to avoid a drift towards the law and away from grace. Now, if, if you're particularly sensitive to some things, you may not like that statement, but let me explain what I mean. I'm not in any way talking about changing our theology, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But it is natural for churches over time to drift towards policy instead of drifting towards people. And that's exactly what happened to the New Testament church. They had a problem, an issue, a disagreement, and instead of having a conversation, they drifted towards a policy. And again, policies have their place. But remember this, policies can never replace grace. Remember when Jesus was talking, uh, he was walking along one day and, and he came upon Zacchaeus. Remember that? The, the tax collector, he was sitting in his tax collector booth and Zacchaeus actually climbed up in the tree to see him. Did, did Jesus say, Zacchaeus, I want you to repent of the evils of being a tax collector. Alright, I want you to, I just heard someone say amen. That's not nice. Don't, don't, don't do that. Did Jesus say, Zacchaeus, I want you to give half of what, you, of what you got to the poor. I want you to give the other half to repay people you've been cheating. And then when you've done that, you track me down and we'll talk about where you stand with God. Is that what Jesus said? No. You know what Jesus said? Hey, Zacchaeus, I'm hungry. Who's up for lunch? I mean, literally, that's what he said to Zacchaeus. He went to Zacchaeus' house. He started a relationship with him that eventually bl blossomed into Zacchaeus becoming a follower of Christ. And once Zacchaeus had been changed, once his heart had changed, then Zacchaeus made the decision on his own to make some things right that had previously been very wrong in his life. Do you see how it worked? And if you think about it, Jesus, he often used conversation over policy. Pop quiz. Woman caught in adultery. Thinking about Jesus now? Policy or conversation? Which, which way did he go? Conversation. Uh, man born blind. Remember that? Policy or conversation? Conversation. Uh, Samaritan woman at the well. Policy or conversation? Conversation. Rich young ruler. Ha! That was a trick. Jesus actually gave the rich young ruler a policy. Okay, he said, no, no, here's what you're going to do. You've got to do these things before you're going to be allowed to follow me. Okay, policy has its place. But conversation and grace and relationship must always come first. Here's the third thing that we must avoid. We must avoid a drift towards preserving rather than advancing. Write that down. That is one of the most important things that I'm going to say to you today. We must avoid a drift towards preservation rather than advancement. For those of you who have ever started your own business, do you remember when you started with nothing? Huh? Remember when you had absolutely nothing? There was nothing to preserve because you had nothing to lose, right? And, and, and then do you remember when you became a medium-sized business? Or, or maybe a large business, and all of a sudden, you, this, this strange urge came on you to start protecting things, right? To kind of keep everything the way it was, to preserve what you had brought to the table. In the beginning, you were a major risk taker. But now you, you shy away from risk. Why? Because there's a lot to lose if you mess this up, right? I mean, you're in a business, you mess it up. I mean, it's your family, it's other people's family. There's a lot of responsibility there. Well, guess what? Churches are exactly the same way. In the beginning, you don't have much. There's not very many people. There's not a lot of resources. But eventually, you start to grow. Eventually, you, you start to build buildings, and you raise budgets, and you start new ministries and programs. And then all of a sudden, you look around one day, and you go, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We're doing all this stuff. Where are all the people we were going to reach with these new buildings and budgets and ministries? Well, they're long gone. You know why? Because there came a point where the church became about us insiders, instead of about reaching others, outsiders. Well, the Jewish Christians, they did the exact same thing. In the beginning, they had nothing. 
But then as the movement grew and they could feel some of their control slipping away, do you kind of see that as we read through the text? They felt like they needed to slam on the brakes. Have you ever slammed on the brakes in church? Huh? Come on. Whoa, 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 preacher. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not comfortable with this direction that we're going. You know, you know what the Jewish Christians basically said? They, they basically looked up one day and they said, you know what, we can't let everybody in on this. I mean, we can't have everybody doing this. We need to set some guidelines. We need to develop some policies. We need to re-emphasize some rules. And let me ask you, what do you think the outcome would have been if not for Paul and Barnabas and Peter and James speaking up? Folks, the early church would have become like so many churches across our country today. Organized, comfortable, and irrelevant. Folks, we cannot let that happen at Oakdale. Mm -mm. See, God has blessed us in so many ways over the years for a long, long time. But folks, those blessings are not just for us. Do you know that? Those blessings were to help us to provide us with some of the resources we need to continue being the church that this community and beyond needs for us to be. So here are three commitments I want to challenge you with in response to those three things that I believe we must avoid. Here they are. Number one, we must be bold. We must be bold. Are you starting to get the picture that I'm hung up on us being bold? Are you starting to figure that out? We need to be boldly sharing Christ. We need to be boldly inviting people into our church life. We need to be boldly designing programs and ministries and opportunities that speak to people who are not part of the church. Here's number two. If we're going to err, we've got to err on the side of grace. That's what we see here in Acts. When there is a conflict, when there is a disagreement or an issue that's got to be addressed, we are going to look over our policies. All right? We're going to consider biblical principles and how they apply. We're going to do that every single time. But in the end, if we're going to err, if we're going to mess up, let's mess up on the side of grace. You know why? Because aren't you glad God leaned that direction when it came to you? I know I am. Aren't you glad God didn't say, you know what, I love you, but here are 613 things you haven't been doing that you need to do right. And when you do them, then you can come back and talk to me. Aren't you glad instead that God knew your heart? That He heard your heart's cry long before you ever changed even a little bit for the better? Guys, if we're going to mess up, let's mess up on the side of grace. And then finally, in response to, to what we saw there, we must remain open-handed. Write that word in. You may not know exactly what I'm talking about, but I want you to write it in anyway. And here's what I do mean. If you've been around long enough to hear me teach on stewardship, you probably heard this principle. It says that God gives me a little bit of time, you remember this, and a little bit of stuff, or a little bit of money, or a little bit of resources, whatever we want to say. He gives us that to do as much good as I can possibly do for God's glory in my lifetime. And instead of taking what God entrusted me and closing my hands and saying, mine, my blessings, my resources, instead of that, what do we do? We open our hands to God. And we allow Him to give and to take as He pleases, knowing that He is much smarter than we are when it comes to figuring out how to use the resources that He blesses us with. So this means being generous to God and others, but it also means, listen, it also means taking some risks as a church. You see, the more God gives us, the more we have to lose. But if we're willing to risk everything for God, then we'll have so much more potential than we ever had before. And I'll be honest with you, that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the kind of pastor I believe God has called me to be. So, if you're thinking that my role is to be a, a religious custodian, coming along behind you and cleaning up after you and, and, and making sure everything is preserved, and you know, just you're not going to enjoy the church experience here at Oakdale very much. At least not till I'm gone. Don't get any ideas, all right? 
Like, oh, wait a minute, I can put two, two together. <laughs> Listen, I love you. Let's not be a church that accidentally drifts into a position where we preserve and protect something rather than boldly advancing something. Amen? Let's be a church that is a risk taker. Let's be a church that, that understands the need for policy and principle, but also errs on the side of grace. Let's make sure, whatever we do, that we do not become a church that allows our focus to drift to insiders and away from those on the outside that God desperately and passionately wants us to reach. I believe it's the only reason we're here. There's a lot of things that we do here. There's a lot of great things about being a part of Oakdale Baptist Church. There are a lot of personal benefits and blessings that we get, right? And, and, it, and it's all part of it. But the most important thing that happens is when we reach out to people who are not part of us. That's what we're here for. Let's bow our heads. Let's go to God. Let's think about a commitment that, that He would have us to make. This morning, as we started worship, DJ mentioned three different songs that kind of addressed three different places that people might be. Maybe, maybe we're here and things are going great and we can't hardly wait to just lift up God's name and, and celebrate. Maybe we're here and we're just struggling. It's just a, it's a hard time right now for a lot of different reasons. Maybe people know about them. Maybe nobody knows. Some of us are in a place where our we feel closer to God than we've ever felt, and some of us couldn't feel further from God. Do you remember that I said that the church is not a building, it's not a place, it's a body, it's a family, it's a movement of people? In order for us to be the body God has called us to be, there must be individual health within that body. So right here, right now, let me just challenge you to respond to God's Word. Respond to what we read and what we saw and the principles that we can draw from it. Are you willing to be bold in your relationship with God? Are you willing to speak out, to speak up, to be a bold witness as Paul was a bold witness for God? Are you willing to be a part of a church that is open-handed, that's a risk-taker, that allows God to give and take freely because we know He can do it much better than we can. I want to challenge you this morning. Let's reconsider who we are as a church. Let's realign ourselves with the priorities of the New Testament, the book of Acts, the early church, the teachings that we read. And let's just ask God, to draw us closer to Him. Heavenly Father, I just lift up Oakdale Baptist Church, just who we are. We're not a building. We're not a place. We're Your people. We're Your body. We're Your bride. And God, we are a body that's made up of individual parts and, and it requires individual health for the whole body to be healthy. And we know that's not going to happen all the time in every way. But God, we want to draw closer and closer and closer to you. We want to become more and more like the church you designed us and dreamed for us to be. God, it's easy for us to look at Acts and look at the, the, the Jewish Christians and the Pharisees. and It's easy for us to point a finger and go, they were way off. They were way off. But it's kind of ridiculous, God, because we do some of the very same things. And we have 2,000 years worth of history. We should know better. It's just, it's something in us. It's, it's the, the flesh that we still deal with. And God, I just pray that as a people, we would desire just to, to crucify the flesh and allow your Holy Spirit to move and work in our lives and in our church. Father, I pray for those who are here this morning that are not Christians. And God, it could very well be that some of the things we talked about this morning that can be wrong with the church are some of the, the things that caused a hurdle or a stumbling block for them to want to be a part of your family, to want to be a part of, of this Christianity thing. God, will you just as a body, will you forgive us? 
where we've become a stumbling block to someone. But not just that, not just forgiveness. Will you help us to change? And God, we pray that we would never get in somebody's way of coming to know you. So if they're here this morning and they're feeling a tug on their heart that's coming from you, I just pray that despite us, that they would come and they'd give their heart and their life and their faith and their eternity to you through Jesus. Plus nothing. God, work in our heart this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray.